greetings. Uh, this is Floria Munch. Uh, I'm here at the office of Sky Harbor Resources and uh, Jordan Trimble is joining me. So good to have you here, Jordan. Great to have you here. It's been, uh, well, I guess PDAC last year, right before everything locked down. So good to see you again. And now we are here again, so yeah. in person. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Sky Harbor Resources is a uranium exploration and development company. So uh, we will, of course, talk about the uranium market because it's r right hot right now. Um, so let's go into the macro picture first and uh, later, of course, uh, some recent developments in your company. Well, look, there's lots to catch up on. Um, obviously, a lot's changed in the last year and a half, uh, call it almost two years. Um, you know, we'll start with the underlying fundamentals because I think e despite the recent uh, price action move higher that we've seen, which the, you know, the main driver for that's obviously been the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust in the spot market, there's still a very compelling underlying fundamentals for this commodity. So okay. we'll start with the, the demand side. Um, we've seen a notable resurgence in interest in the space and in investor sentiment. Um, you know, the demand side's always been uh, a, a key selling feature uh, with uranium. Uh, uranium used in nuclear power plants, it's the only source of scalable, affordable, clean baseload electricity. Obviously, with recent severe weather incidents and in, in, in natural mm -hmm. disasters, mm -hmm. we've seen uh, the, the, some of the pitfalls of intermittent electricity generation. And so uh, I think we'll see the, the continued resurgence in uh, nuclear power sentiment, positive sentiment, and as a result of that, um, increasing interest in, in uranium mining companies as we work towards decarbonizing our electricity grids, uh, moving towards a carbon neutral uh, economic uh, system globally. Um, so uh, as demand continues to increase with reactor builds, you've got uh, about 50 reactors under construction today. You've got f uh, about 440, just over 440 operable reactors uh, globally. And we have seen some good news more recently on the prevention of premature closures uh, of, of some of these reactors, most notably in the last few weeks in the States, a couple of reactors uh, right. that uh, okay. had a big subsidy to keep them running. So I think we'll see that continue. Again, we, we need uh, to emphasize the importance of nuclear energy as we continue to decarbonize, right? And places like the US and China and some of the biggest economies in the world are, 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 have been doing that, but I think there needs to be a continued push uh, from people and from governments um, uh, in order to combat climate change and, and improve air quality. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, nuclear is gonna play an integral role uh, in, in the solution there. So the demand side has been relatively stable. It's growing. I think we're going to see it really kick into hyperdrive potentially with uh, some of these uh, new advanced nuclear technologies and, and small modular reactors. We've seen lots of news out on that over the last year, year and a half. You've, you have notable people like Bill Gates and uh, Peter Thiel and uh, even recently Elon Musk talking about nuclear energy and talking about some of these new advanced nuclear technologies. So uh, the demand side you're looking at about 180 to 185 million pounds of annual demand. But what's really been interesting in the last five years um, has been the supply side. We've seen a major uh, supply side response play out, a rebalancing in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen that. Supply was, was cut by major players? It, it oh. was, yeah. And so if you look at uh, 2016, we had primary mine supply globally of about 165 million pounds. And that was before some of these major cuts like MacArthur River in, in northern Saskatchewan mm -hmm. and, and like uh, the, the cuts that we've seen in Kazakhstan. So as a result of that, we've we've seen, uh, well, it's ju it, not just the production cuts that, that were announced uh, due to the low prices, but also depleting mine reserves as well. I think that's important to highlight that. You know, it wasn't just these miners deciding uh, to cut production because it was uneconomic, but uh, also uh, a lot of mines have been producing for decades and, and they're simply running out of reserves. Right? I think that's uh, worth mentioning for the bigger picture for interested investors. So there had been many, many years in the market market in the uranium market uh, where the actual price of the commodity was too low for most most or, or almost all producers to make money on it yeah. and this is unsustainable in the in the long term and now we've seen a price uptick for yeah, the first time in, in, uh, in many, many exactly, years. Exactly, exactly. And, and so it's you know, changing. You, you could see it uh, with the, you know, the price of the commodity in, in 20, uh, 2010, 2011, pre-Fukushima. We saw the price rise from 40 to $70, right? And you know, this, is, this isn't including what we saw in, in 05, 06, 07, whereas we know the price rose from basically 
$15 a pound to $140 a pound. But if you look at it pre-Fukushima, those couple of years leading up to Fukushima, you had a price move uh, of almost a double, $40 to $70. Fukushima happened, the industry was more or less decimated after that. We saw the price dwindle all the way down to sub $18 a pound, which is in inflation adjusted terms, one of the lowest it's ever traded at and, and needless to say, not sustainable. Now, since then, as I said, we've seen this supply side uh, response play out and uh, we've seen some major production curtailment. We've seen, again, mines come to the end of their lives. So we've seen that primary mine supply decrease from about 165 million pounds down to last year, about 120 to 125 million pounds of primary mine supply. And that was exacerbated by the pandemic, right? And I think there's an, an important uh, point there. Um, this The risks to the supply side far exceed the risks to the demand side. We can see major supply shocks, which is what we saw in 2020. At one point, uh, there was almost 50% of primary mine supply that was offline last April and last May. And again, part of that had to do with the pandemic. Question right? about that. How fast are these uh, major mines, these major suppliers able to ramp up again? So is, is a mine closed for, for a couple of years, uh, care and maintenance? Or is it easy without further investment to, for example, reopen those ISR plays uh, yeah. no, it's in, a, in Kazakhstan? It's a great question. So it depends on the mine, right? Um, mm. If you look at right now, MacArthur River, for example, it's not, you, they're not going to be able to turn MacArthur River back on overnight. It yeah. is going to take a bit of time. Um, but nonetheless, as the price continues to rise, you will see the restart there. And with the Kazakhs, um, uh, it's worth noting that their ability to drill and their ability to uh, advance the projects uh, and, and uh, invest sustaining capital into these projects for their well field development was, was impacted last year quite seriously by COVID. So um, they have announced a 20% reduction in production through 2023. They announced that relatively recently. We'll see how quickly they ramp up. Eventually they will ramp back up though. But as you and I were talking previously, um, one other thing that I think is getting lost in the conversation right now is that even with these restarts, even with the ramp up back at places uh, in places like Kazakhstan, you're still looking at a primary mine supply deficit. You're still looking at a structural deficit. So yeah. if we use that 2016 figure of 160 to 165 million pounds of primary mine supply, that's still a pretty significant shortfall that has to be met, met by decreasing inventories and above ground stockpiles. And so this brings me into brings us into the situation we're in right now, where yes, we've seen this rapid move higher in the spot price, predominantly driven by the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. They've mm -hmm. raised uh, thus far three, the initial 300 million. They've moved the price from uh, $30 a pound just over a month ago to almost $50 a pound. 300 million is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. So that just shows you how, you know, if how the big money comes into is. that uh, uh, thin market. And, yeah. and it is right. So they've announced the additional $1 billion increase. So we'll see, you know, we'll see how the market responds to it. But I think what, what you're seeing is true price discovery being led uh, by a uh, financial entity. But where it's going to get really interesting is when the utility companies come back to the market. We've talked about this at length uh, for the last several years. Really the only end user of, of uranium are nuclear utility companies and they're the main buyer, right? They're usually the ones that result in the highest price move for this metal price in, in, in throughout history. And so if you look at uh, the situation that's unfolding right now where yes you've had financial entities like like the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust that have been moving the market higher recently um, what will happen when the utilities come back and start contracting and start this new pro procurement cycle which they have to we know yeah. there's by yeah. 2035 there's about 1.4 billion pounds of material that needs to be that needs to be contracted that needs to come from somewhere so uh, very interesting times I think we saw, you know, as we've talked about in previous interviews, I think the, the bottom was put in in 2016. There is going to be volatility. Um, that is a uh, very <clears throat> common place in this in this industry where you get these markets moving higher or lower. And, you know, there's going to be, it's not going to go straight up, um, but it, it's, it's moving in the right direction right now. And I still think, bottom line is, I still think there's a lot of runway. I think there's a lot of room to move from where we're at at 
call it 45 to 50 dollars a pound right now you're still uh, below the average all-in global cost of production you're still below the price needed to incentivize any new meaningful production to come online and just drawing one quick comparison to 06 07 06 07 when you had the price skyrocket and you had it at you know 130 140 dollars a pound and you know every there was 500 plus uranium companies publicly traded globally at that point, you had two major producers coming on, one of which was Kazakhstan ramping up, mm -hmm. right? And the other was Cigar Lake. And that was one of the reasons that you had the big um, blow off top when you did. Uh, it's a Cameco mine? And yeah, it's, 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 is Cigar it shut down or is it not? No, it's, 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 running. it's running, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's one of the largest and, and richest uranium deposits and mines in the world. And, uh, but that was coming online in the mid 2000s. That was one of the reasons the price took off because there was the Cigar Lake flood. So in this cycle, Cycle. Yes, you do have some new uh, production that can come online in the short term, but it's not meaningful number of pounds, right? It's going to take time for some of the larger deposits, development projects to come online. So you, you I think this could be a sustained bull market. Um, I think we're still in the early innings of it. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens with the next billion dollars that comes into the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. But so far, it's it's been a, it's been a pretty wild ride. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask about that. I think uh, many investors who are interested in uranium now have not had any contact with it before. Yeah? Like, yeah. like no, uh, no, be, yeah. being the hardcore contrarian, uh, like in a in a really long period of underinvestment and yeah, yeah, not not good uh, developments. And now it's uh, it's coming up again. So it, it is. How, yeah. You you think it's going to be a sustainable um, uh, development, um, but. People remember the previous cycle where yeah. the uranium price uh, doubled and tripled, and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the the companies actually they, they were all multi beggars. Yes, so and, and that's, it's a great that's yeah, something no, no, we can expect. Well, or? look, I, th there's a simple reason for that, right? Um, it is not a crowded space. It's not yeah. a crowded sector, right? If you want to get investment exposure to gold or to copper or to oil and gas, there's hundreds of different ways to do that. If you want investment exposure to uranium, there's very few ways. Uh, and one of the few ways is investing in the traditional uranium mining equities. And if you look at the total combined market capitalization of all publicly traded uranium equities today, it's still 35, just under 40 billion dollars. It's still quite low. Um, wow. Back in the previous cycle, it was over 150 billion. And again, this is without any inflation adjustment. So again, I still think there is a lot of room to move. I think it's still the early days. Um, there will be more companies that come into the space. We're getting a lot of interest right now in some of our other projects because we have one of the largest land holdings in the Athabasca Basin. Um, so I think as you see the market continue to move, the metal price continue to move higher, the companies, you know, the 50 or 60 active uranium uh, mining companies and junior mining companies globally, you'll see uh, continued leverage to that rising metal price uh, with those companies. Um, and you'll see more, more issuers come to market, much like we saw in the mid 2000s, mm -hmm. much like we saw in 2010, 2011. But I do believe that the uh, companies that stuck it out through the last 10 difficult years of, of a bear market uh, that were able to consolidate great assets and put together the best management and technical teams will be the ones that benefit the most. Yeah, and you are located in the Athabasca Basin, so the, the most prolific uh, uranium area in the world. Yeah, yeah, we can, we yeah. can say that. And we, uh, yeah, we, we're, we're, so our story is pretty yeah. straightforward, right? We're one of the uh, few remaining active exploration and early stage development companies in the Athabasca Basin. Um, we started the company eight years ago, so we were there as contrarians when, when no one else cared about uranium, uh, which afforded us the opportunity to go and build the project portfolio that we have. So we've now accumulated, uh, and we're still in the process of, of, of adding to that portfolio, but thus far we've, we've built a portfolio of six uh, drill-ready projects scattered throughout the Athabasca Basin. Again, the highest grade depository of uranium in the world. Uh, we've got two deposits. Uh, we're advancing our flagship project, Moore Lake, right now with an, with an ongoing uh, drill program, actually one of our largest drill programs to date, fully funded for that and for the drilling we have planned next year there. Uh, and then we, we uh, act as a prospect generator, uh, as you know. So we, we, we look to farm out or option or joint venture out our other projects. We have other companies spend the money and uh, we, we usually take uh, a big equity position in the company. And then once they've earned in, we carry on as a joint venture partner with them. Yeah, and I think this is uh, part of your success story in this in this hard year. Years, um, because uh, with the joint venture models, uh, you are able to uh, achieve results uh, with 
other people's money kind of yeah, yeah. because of course in a joint venture you own only uh, like half of it or a fraction or uh, whatever of the of the um, project but um, yeah this allowed you not to dilute uh, mm -hmm. too much yeah you know and now uh, we are in sky have a, in a good position to move forward yeah so uh, really excited about that yeah um, anything you would like to add uh, about sky harbor maybe uh, go a little bit into um, developments to come soon sure sure yeah so upcoming catalysts well I mean for for the viewers and the audience that have been following the story you'll see we've been quite active over the last year year and a half as we've seen the market pick up we've had uh, uh, lots of uh, lots of money come in through a warrant exercise and uh, we, we had a big batch that were expiring this year so uh, you know all, all of those most of those have come in now so we're, we're well funded for all of these uh, upcoming plans and, and uh, exploration programs that we're looking to carry out over the next 12 months but uh, just to recap uh, the previous 12 months so we've been fairly active exploring our flagship more lake project delivering high-grade drill results we just announced results recently first batch of uh, uh, geochemical assays from this drill program we had one hole that returned 2.54 uh, percent uh, u308 over six meters within that two meters of uh -huh. 6.8 percent u308 so very high grade um, what's exciting about that is it's it's hosted in a geological setting that's been um, that hasn't been tested extensively historically on the project so we have high grade mineralization at the sandstone right at what's called the unconformity but we haven't there has been a lot of historical work of drilling to test these basement rocks below that and that's what we're testing that was ne next gen did next gen's deposits basement hosted as mm -hmm. is fissions as mm -hmm. is the griffin deposit so more more of the recent discoveries that have been made in the yep. basin have been made in these underlying uh, basement rocks and so what's what's exciting for us is we're now able to properly test these targets at depth and we have what's called our maverick east zone that we're continuing to follow this high grade mineralization yeah. zone and zone at depth and down plunge so we'll have more results from uh, the, the drill dr drilling there which will last us right through probably until the end of the year we'll, we'll start back up again early in the new year we are working towards a resource estimate early in the new year as well so that's a key upcoming milestone and catalyst for the company and then again getting back to our partner companies we've we've got three partner companies uh, one of which is with industry leader Arano at our Preston project over on the west side of the basin by mm -hmm. uh, Fission and Next Gen, and then we have another company uh, that we're joint venture partners with as well what's called their East Preston project and that company is as in court and they've completed their joint venture their earn in for the joint venture partnership now they're planning a big 7,000 meter drill program uh, early in the new year they've just uh, carried out some uh, low altitude radiometrics similar to what Fission and, and Alpha did in the early days of the PLS discovery and then more recently um, we brought in a third partner company uh, Valor uh, which is Valor Resources which is an ASX listed company it's done incredibly well they've been actively advancing our Hook Lake project they have an earn in for up to 80 percent to that project they have to spend about three and a half million uh, in exploration over a three-year period just under half a million in cash and we own uh, over 233 million shares of the company which has obviously gone up in value quite a bit over the last uh, several several weeks so um, it's a great uh, way for us to um, not just ensure that the, the the projects are being advanced and that you know other companies are funding these work programs but we also uh, will usually retain an equity holding in the partner company so as you see this rising tide with the uranium stocks we benefit with uh, with having stock in other uh, partner companies so yeah. lots going on um, uh, it's it's going to be an exciting 12 months coming up it's it's uh, there is going to be volatility uh, but I do believe that we, we still are in the early days of, of the next uranium bull market. Um, the fundamentals are there to justify it. We finally now have a you know a real catalyst in the market, um, and uh, we have lots of news flow, uh, lots of upcoming catalysts in the next six to twelve months with all of our drilling, with all of our partner-funded programs, and uh, so uh, timing is is great for for people to look at the space and, and to look at Sky Harbor. I think that's a wonderful closing statement, uh, Jordan Trimble of Sky Harbor Resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, if you want to look up the stock, it's uh, under the symbol SYH uh, on the TSX Venture Exchange. And I will post the WKN for the German viewers below. Thank you. Thank you.